Please welcome the President and Chief Executive Officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, Daniel Lepp. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, um, it's my one job for the week. I hope I do it well, but first I'd like to start off with uh, uh, thanking you, Mark, for a great job as the con conference chair. It's, uh, you and, and Sandy and all the staff do a terrific job. It's, I think, nine years ago when I had your job, and it is not a fun job. As I say, Joe, next to you, it's a, it's a fun job, but a tough job, and thanks for what you've done. Thank you. Um, as I, uh, my job today is to uh, introduce someone that we know very well, but I give it a little bit of context. When you think back, and, and Bill talked a little bit about it, you go back into 07, 08, and 09, and where we were at as a state, and then you fast forward yourself to today. And we're at a point where the unemployment rate in Michigan is uh, equal to the national average, which is a big deal, because when you think about where we were at, it's unbelievable. We're ahead of both New York and Illinois from an unemployment standpoint. But I think, though, probably when I think about the impact that the governor has had on the state of Michigan, two things come to mind, being a, uh, a Detroiter and uh, being totally invested in the city of Detroit and urban areas. Uh, what's happened in the last year in Detroit, we sort of almost in a weird way take it for granted. And to think about what's happened, and I see Kevin Orr here today, that, that what, what everybody came together, and that's, I think, the key to this governor of bringing people together, whether, whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican, you're bringing, he's bringing things together, and to get done what we got done collectively in the city of Detroit is uh, it's just an amazing feat. And I tie that with, uh, I think back to 10 years ago when I chaired this conference, um, the West didn't like the East very much and the East didn't like the West very much. And that has completely changed. There is no angst. There is one Michigan at this point where the West and the East view each other as equally important. And I think in a lot of ways that goes to the leadership uh, of Governor Rick Snyder. So it is indeed my pleasure to introduce the governor of the great state of Michigan, Rick Snyder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, thank you for that wonderful welcome. It is great to be with you again. Are you getting tired of having me show up every day? <laughs> no, and I just love the panel and Bill Ford and the wonderful things. So you can see what industry in our state can do and companies that have achieved incredible things with great leadership. Now, I'm going to do something a little different than I've done in the past. I thought it was good to, to make sure we had audience involvement to some degree, to make sure you're staying alert now that I'm up here. So I've got a little quiz for you. So we're going to go through a quiz with a few questions. And I'm not going to ask you to state your answer, but keep track and see how well you do on the quiz. There's five questions plus a bonus round, OK? You ready to go? OK, first question. Back in 10 years ago or so, our corporate income tax ranking, we were ranked 49th out of the 50 states. Now, what do you think our rank is today? Ready? And the answer is number 10. So we've gone up 40 places just about in just the last few years. Now the next question. How many states have a more improved credit rating than Michigan since 2011? Now not quite that. We didn't quite make that. There's one. And it was the state of North Dakota because they had an oil boom. <laughs> OK, next one. Now, I'm going to multiple choice to give you more opportunities to get them right. If you've been struggling so far, here's your chance. Where does Michigan's economic health rank nationally, and this was, again, done, the last two have been done by Bloomberg's analysis, are we second, sixth, eighth, or tenth in terms of economic health in the United States, the state of Michigan? And the answer is, we're second.
Now we got one more for you. There's two blanks to this one. Oh, sorry, we got one before that one. Michigan's entrepreneurial climate was ranked 41st in 2008. What's our rank today? Okay, and the answer is six. Okay, next one. Michigan has created blank new private sector jobs, the blank most in the nation. Now, you've heard me do this one on the campaign trail, so the first blank should be easy enough. The second one may be harder. You ready for the answers? And the answers are 400,000, which ranks us number five in the country for the most private sector jobs of any state in the nation in the last four years. Okay, this is like the bonus round now. For those of you that have been doing well, we've got one final question. The bonus question, when was the last time Michigan was on par with the national unemployment rate? To give you a little history, when I took office, we were at 11.2%. Recently, a couple months ago, a month or so ago, we hit 5.6. We dropped it in half, and recently we just hit the national average. And the last time we did that was September 2000, 15 years ago. We're back, folks. So I hope you enjoyed this little quiz. Um, I have no prizes for anyone. Um, I thought it would set the stage, though, to put things in perspective a little bit. Because what I want to do was not talk about just short-term issues. And we have some short-term issues that do have major implications. I've been doing lots of press, and I've been getting questions on roads, transportation, um, schools, particularly Detroit. These are critically important issues. But I'm going to diverge from that to talk to you about something that we don't talk about often enough. Those are urgent and important issues, but I think there are other important big topics we don't talk about very often. And that's what I want to share with you today. Get a thought-provoking process going with you, because we need to do this together. And it's based on the theme of the conference, which is cohesion. What does cohesion mean? It means stickiness, attractiveness, bringing things together so they bind together, so they can do things together. And for Michigan to have long-term success is we need cohesion for not just the next year, not for the next three years of my term in office, but for the next decade and two decades and longer. To really do things right, you know this in life. It's not about a short-term commitment to doing something. It's about doing it in a focused fashion that's sustainable over the long term. And it's not about who happens to be governor, or who happens to be in the legislature, or who happens to lead an organization. It's about creating a culture of long-term success, a culture of cohesion. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time today sharing a few themes, the themes of cohesiveness that I believe we need in Michigan. And I hope it really causes some thought and discussion for the rest of this conference and for months and years to come, because that's what really matters. This isn't just about us. We have a very successful group of people in this room. This is about figuring out how to do it for our 10 million other family members and their kids and their kids. So let me start by talking about big themes. The first one is economic growth. How do we create a long-term path of sustainable economic growth in the state of Michigan? And one of the first issues you should get is, why is that a big deal? Not often do you ever sit down with anyone and say, well, why is economic growth even important? The reason it's important is simple. It's about growing a population. We want to grow Michigan in terms of how many people we have here. We want to grow how many jobs we have. We want to improve the quality of the jobs we have. We want to increase the income levels of people holding those jobs and their families. And that's all based on economic growth and economic development. Now, we each have a role to play in economic development. And to be blunt, the role of government is not job creation. Our role is to create the environment for success, the operating conditions that allow fabulous companies like Ford and Blue Cross to be highly successful and let them create the jobs. 
to say this is the place they want to do that growth in. So on economic growth, what are the drivers you need to look at? I put one up to start with just to give you an illustration. What's the court tax situation in a state? Again, we've improved dramatically in terms of being competitive compared to the rest of the country. Regulatory reform, we've gotten rid of nearly 2,000 regulations in this state. But more important than the number is how we're treating people and treating people assuming that they're good people and how do we help them succeed and comply with regulations, not penalize them. Things like unemployment insurance rates, workers' compensation. There's a whole series of these, and we do have two or three things right in front of us that are critical to economic development that we should be addressing this year. One being transportation. Infrastructure is critically important. A second one is, as I did a special message on energy policy. We need a long-term sustainable energy policy that reflects reliability, affordability, and being environmentally responsible. We need to put these things in place. And then we need to stay the course. Again, it's always great to have dialogues and discussion, but let's set these parameters in this environment, this focus, and just keep her on the rails and go. Hit the gas and go. That's how you grow an economy. Now, the one I haven't mentioned yet is number one on my list. And it came up yesterday. And you know I'm absolutely passionate. It's about talent. The greatest competitive opportunity we have is the talent in Michigan. We have a huge national problem with STEM, a huge national problem with skilled trades. If you talk to business people, they'll tell you, they're looking to go to the places that have the most talented people with the right training at the right time at the right place. That is the focus. That is the opportunity we have in front of us. We need to make that commitment that we're going to be number one. That's what I've told you I believe should be our top priority. I hope you join me in making that top priority. The jurisdiction, the place that does the best at developing the skilled trades, STEM, these opportunities, and follows through on it will have a competitive economic advantage in this country and in this world. We need to seize that opportunity. So economic development is this first huge theme. The second one is related to it, and that's why I save talent for the end. It's about our educational system. That's the lifeblood of our future. And we need to redefine that. I've talked about this before, but I want to reinforce it with you. We need to stop thinking about silos. The silos of K-12, the silo of preschool, the silo of universities, the silo of community colleges. They're outstanding institutions. I don't want to threaten those institutions, but I want to challenge us to say, it's not about each piece of that, but how do they fit in a system of P-20, prenatal through lifelong learning, where it's a seamless system. If you're that student, that user of that system, you shouldn't have to struggle to make decisions based on silos. You should be able to decide you want to learn. You want to gain skills any place, any time, any way, any pace. The four any's. That's the kind of educational system we should be developing. Those are our opportunities. We're starting to build those building blocks now, but we have a lot of work to do. You've heard it in the discussion about education in Detroit, but it's statewide. But we should be proud of the building blocks we're already starting to put in place. Over the last couple years, Michigan's made the largest investment in preschool of any state in the nation. We should be proud of that. We're behind in third grade reading, but it's great. We have a wonderful group done by a great commission coming out with a report just next week on pre-3, preschool through third grade reading, about how we can put Michigan back on a leadership path so third graders have the ability to read. That is one of the most important single metrics in someone's life. Think about that. How would you like to be eight years old and say, I face one of the greatest measures of the rest of my life? We need to help them be successful. We are not cutting it the way we need to yet. Pre-3. The other one I've talked about a little bit about these silos is we need to draw a circle around high school and higher education to make it much more seamless. You heard Mike grow. Career tech education, the skilled trades, what a great opportunity. But think about our state. And again, we have outstanding educators in many cases. We have outstanding institutions. But we make it really hard for our young people. 
Do they go to an intermediate school district? Do they go to their school district? Do they go to a community college? Do they go to an outside training program to get the skills they need? It varies everywhere differently across Michigan. We need to make it easy for people. We need to encourage parents and young people to look at these as honorable, well-paying career opportunities. We have tens of thousands of great opportunities right in front of us. Let's fill those positions. When people talk about the income inequality issue in our country, which is a serious issue, the best way to solve it, get people a great, well-paying job. Let's be the leader again. That's the other reason to reinforce making talent number one. So P20, so think about it that way. Now the next one is back to the government realm. You deserve efficient, effective, and accountable government. You deserve better than you're getting. And I'm speaking even about what we're trying to provide. We can do better in this country. And it starts with fundamentals again. One, are we doing smart budgeting? Are we being responsible with your funds? You worked hard to earn those dollars. We should only be asking for them and we should only be deploying them in ways that really make a difference in improving lives in the areas that government should be involved. We've come light years in Michigan, but I still want us to get better. Again, we're on the cusp of five years in a row of doing the fastest budgets in the last 30 years and doing them structurally sound, balanced, and thoughtful. That's progress. <laughs> but shouldn't you be demanding that happens for the next 10 or 20 years? That's my point. To say it happened for five, you should say, well, that's nice. What about the next five? What about the next 15? That's what you need to be asking of us. The other piece that goes with it is we need to be financially responsible, just like a family. We need to be good stewards of your resources. And in many cases in the public sector, we've driven ourselves into debt. We created huge liability problems. And I'm speaking when I say we about the public sector in the United States. That problem has to get solved. And that's something that's a, a big question that, again, this is where you can find politics coming into play. You'll find certain people saying, we need to spend more right now. And you'll find other people saying, we need to cut taxes right now. Where's the group to say, we need to act like a financially responsible family, and before we start talking about either ones of those, if we owe money to someone, shouldn't we have a payment plan and make our payments? Again, we shouldn't be thinking about government operating differently than a family. This is common sense. And we were doing that in Michigan. At the state level, our primary obligations are pension and post-retiree medical. When I took office, there were about $60 billion. We did reforms. We changed your practices. We put in a payment plan. It effectively dropped it to $40 billion. But more, more important than telling you it's $40 billion, I can tell you, we are funding our payment plan so in 2038, those obligations will be paid off. They'll be gone. Isn't that the kind of responsibility you deserve out of government? And don't we need to have all of us standing up to say, don't touch that payment plan for the next 20 years? Let's follow through and make sure we're making those payments. It's absolutely incredible if you do the math. What happens after those, when we get to 2038, how many dollars get freed up? It's literally billions of dollars a year of extra resources because we finally would have done what we should have done long ago. Efficient, effective, and accountable government. The other part of that, though, is, is government does provide important services to people in need. There are people out there that need help, whether it be health care, an opportunity to be successful on the job, an opportunity for a better life. And that's what I talked about in the last State of the State about the river of opportunity. We need to recalibrate about how our government operates. We need to start moving away from the old way of doing things, which was, let's start a new program for every problem. 
It worked well back in the 30s and 40s, 50s and 60s maybe, but it's an old dated model. We have over 150 programs to help people in some fashion, 70 in child services, 45 in workforce. The numbers go on. But you can't be successful by saying you need to help someone be successful and slicing and dicing them into so many different cases. That's where people start losing their dignity. And as part of helping someone, we need to have someone maintain their dignity as a real person. So what I'm trying to move us in Michigan, and this is why you're seeing these department reorganizations, these other things, they're not made to move deck chairs. They're made to move a culture to say, let's move from programs to people. Let's move from solving symptoms that keep people in a dependency status to solving the root cause so people can be successful again on their own. Let's move from keeping track of how many people we're providing services to to how many people did we help not need the service. That's the kind of attitude. And it can't be just about what government's doing for someone. It needs how is the community rallying to help our neighbors, our friends, our fellow Michigan family members. And how do we do that the best way possible? That's the kind of attitude and approach we need to take. That's exciting, and I need your support on that. I think we can lead the country in saying there's a better way of the next generation of how to serve people in need. Other things that are part of efficient, effective, and accountable government. Quality of life. I remember when I was running originally, I always taught old people there are two things. More and better jobs and a future for our kids. Well, there's this symbiotic relationship between having the opportunity to have a job and having outstanding quality of life opportunities in the community you live. They feed on one another. If you can deliver both, the kids stay. They have an opportunity. We're starting to keep our kids, folks. We're starting to get some of those kids back. But we do that by bringing this combination of both together. I talked about economic development. That's where this pillar of urban revitalization, and I'm going to take it beyond that because we have wonderful rural areas in Michigan. We need to do it for every corner of Michigan. And that's about understanding being great stewards of our resources, things like the Great Lakes. I really believe we have a special responsibility in Michigan to the Great Lakes. And I'm proud to say we're playing a leadership role, but we can do more. There are great things about using our outdoors. We're becoming the trail state in the country about how you can have great quality of life enjoying Michigan's wonderful outdoor environment. Arts and culture. Think about the vast improvements in arts and culture. We've been investing now for the last several years. It had been wiped out in our budget. We put it back in. Think about going to Grand Rapids, the art prize. Think about going to the festivals we're now seeing in Detroit. I still love the story of this group of young people coming to me to say, Governor, we want you to come play in our volleyball, sand volleyball game in downtown Detroit. I said, you gotta be kidding me. No, we brought in the sand. <laughs> That's great quality of life. So efficient, effective, and accountable government. And you shouldn't be asking it about someone for the rest of their term. Start asking the question, how do we do it for 20 years? So if you look at these themes, again, economic development and growth, P20, an efficient, effective, and accountable government, these are topics that we don't spend much time really talking about in the big picture sense, but we need to. Too often we live our lives for the urgent. Everything I've talked about to you today is important. Important in a way that's sustainable. And think about if we can bring cohesion to this area, what a difference we can make for Michigan's future. It is our opportunity. I believe it, it is our responsibility because we need to do this, again, not for us, but for millions of others and the millions of others to follow us. And that's how you build that legacy that we heard about in this last panel. 
of a sustainable organization, a sustainable place that can go on for 100 plus years. So I'm asking you to join me on that journey and to join me when I'm no longer governor on that journey. Because I'm not going anywhere out of state when I'm done. <laughs> join me on that journey to say we have raised the bar. We're no longer treating it like politics. We're no longer treating it as just government. We're treating it like family. We're treating it like the family we need to be. Civility, respect, problem solving. I got to say it once, relentless positive action. <laughs> So venues like this are the place to have the dialogue and discussion. I hope to have more of this in Lansing. But be loud and proud Michiganders. And what I'm asking each and one, every one of you to do is not just talk about this conference, because you know me. I don't like just nice meetings. I need you to come out of here and say, when you go back home, you're going to talk to the people you work with, you live with, about these three topics, and cohesion, and relentless positive action to say we're building a foundation to make Michigan the greatest state again. Thank you so much. Please welcome the business economist for the Detroit Free Press, Tom Wall. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Governor. It was great. I guess we got to keep running, keep going fast. I don't know if anybody has asked you this yet, but um, I always ask the tough questions. How's the Achilles? Uh, good. I've not been approved to run or jump yet. I was going to say. But I can do the rest. You, we, don't, we don't have an official 5K time yet. <laughs> no. OK. All right. Well, I cheated a little bit um, on the questions. I didn't make them all up myself. Um, so the first one comes to you uh, courtesy of Kevin Orr. <laughs> and uh, um, Kevin, uh, as well, I'm we were, glad he's not, he can't ask for a raise. He's gone. <laughs> well, <laughs> he deserved a raise. <laughs> well, exactly. But Kevin said one thing he's never heard you say uh, is, when did you first decide to take on Detroit? As Judge Rhodes said, I think, in his uh, final ruling, um, this, was, this was a mess many decades in the making, and others had said the same thing. Other governors, other, other officials had kicked the can down the road or refused to deal with it. You decided at some point to take it on. So what made you take on Detroit, and, uh, and when, what was the timing of that? The timing was February 2009, and it was the right thing to do. It really went back to when I talked to Sue about running for governor. I looked at, there, there were a lot of good people that were talking about running for governor back in that time frame, and there were a number of them that did run for governor. Good people I respect. But they were doing the traditional model. They talked about fixing Michigan. And you know, I never talked about fixing Michigan. I talked about reinventing Michigan, Tom. And this is one of those issues that I thought it had to be taken on. And when I say take it on, it's to help Detroit. It wasn't viewing Detroit as this huge problem, but to say the people of Detroit and all Michiganders deserved a better answer. So this is the part that won't ever show up in the books, but consistently over that whole time period, I was working to improve Detroit. One of the cases that happened to me early in the campaign trail is I was doing a fundraising event in the west side of the state, and I'm not going to tell you where, but one of the questions I got, and I wasn't a very experienced person on the political trail at that point, as the question came up, would you annex Detroit from the state of Michigan? And there was a whole bunch of laughs and some applause. And that pointed out to me how broken our state was. And I respectfully disagreed with the person asking the question to say, we need to go the opposite way. We need to embrace Detroit. We need to all believe Detroit needs to be a great city again. And it was interesting, after it was done, I went up to talk to the person. I said, I'm not trying to, you know, I don't want to have any confrontation here. I just want to understand. Why did you ask that question? What caused you to, you know, why did you bring that up? 
And their answer was really enlightening to me. You know what they said? They said, I was just trying to lighten things up. You look nervous, so I just I'd lighten the place up a little bit. <laughs> True statement in terms of I was nervous, I, I'm, I was still learning this whole process. But he goes, in our community, that's one of the ways you just get sort of people to laugh and stuff. And I said, well, you know, I appreciate that. Thanks for trying to be helpful, but that, think about how destructive <laughs> that statement is. Is when people do that, that becomes part of a culture. And so I made the point after that of every corner of Michigan I went to talking about the need to make Detroit a great city again. And to be blunt, it took a few years of doing that to really get it to stick. And it hasn't stuck as well as I think it still needs to stick. So let's just keep working that attitude. And again, that's the definition of cohesion. All right. Um, I'd like to refer to one of your slides, the one I think that had us in terms of entrepreneurial activity or climate going from 41 to 6. Um, you being a former entrepreneur, yeah. venture capitalist, um, you would know because you've heard, you know, some of the sturm und drang of recent days uh, of what's going on in Lansing with some of the bills uh, that are affecting MEDC budgets and some programs, including the venture capital and seed programs and the funding streams for all of those. And, and uh, uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of economic development people. Um, I see Steve Harwood in the front row. He's been uh, He's been grilled by, by some of the, uh, the folks up in Lansing in recent days on, on some of this stuff about the effect that that, that might have. And, and I just want to quote from, uh, from an email that I know has been making the rounds among some folks in the venture capital uh, industry. And it's, a, it's about House Bills 4007 and 4008. And it says, the, those threaten to undo the work that all of us have done over the past decade or more to make Michigan a leading state for entrepreneurial growth. Uh, the bills decimate the MEDC, uh, cuts half of their funding. Um, talk about that a little bit and how you plan to, uh, to, to deal with, with that in the House and how you think it's going to come out. Yeah, uh, to put it in perspective, every time something like that happens, we lose jobs, investment, and opportunity in the state of Michigan um, because it does send a message that we're not being consistent. And that's one of the reasons I picked the theme I did today, is good economic development, um, you have to have a 10 to 15 year horizon minimum. And I've been doing economic development long before I was governor. I'm proud to say I've been doing economic development over the last 20, 30 years. In fact, I've been on both sides of the equation, where I've been the government person or the community person attracting the businesses, and I've been the decision maker, and I've set up organizations and companies in a half dozen countries around this world. And the first thing business is looking for, even more than to say you're 10th on the list, is they want certainty and consistency in the environment you're operating. And every time you look like you're bouncing around or not have a clear direction that you stay true to, you're creating a disincentive for investment. And I'm not trying to pick on the people that have those bills. I appreciate that. What it means to me is when I see bills like that, again, it's not a comment on the individuals introducing them because there's a reason they feel that way. So again, I respect that. It just means we haven't done our homework as Michiganders to make sure we're on the same page. And that's where this cohesiveness is not fully in place yet. And that's why it was great to have it as the topic of the session. We need to keep on coming back to say, until we get to the point where no one needs to introduce a bill because we all know what we're doing, or we just say, we need to go to the next level and we just need to solve this problem, um, we still have work to do. So again, I respect the people that introduce those bills. It just means I have more work to do, and I hope you join me in believing you have more work to do to make sure we get this concept of consistency, stability, confidence, certainty, success, because think about it, think about how well we're doing. That's one reason I wanted to show those slides. Aren't you proud? And don't you want to just say, I don't need to drive around a curve, I just want to step on the gas? If I want to build, get that, must, that Ford GT back out and let's go. <laughs> so on the subject of consistency though, some of the folks as they're worried about these bills in the legislature and what will kind of 
what the sausage will look like when it comes out, is they look back and they see not consistency over the past 15 years, and you were an early chairman of the MEDC, and this is not new, of course, that the MEDC gets, gets picked on by the legislature every so often during budget time. Um, but back in those days, um, we had large tax credits and other things, and you came in and you did make some changes um, for reasons that you articulated pretty well. Um, how do you think that's, that's played out so far? And, and what I've heard some economic development regional people say is, you know, we're fighting, trying to fight off some of the bad ideas coming in these bills, but what would really help is if the governor were to articulate his vision and thought of what state economic development policy should be outside of consistency, how should we incent uh, large-scale attraction things if we're not going to do it with tax credits? Um, we, I think we got a $100, $100 million pile of, of cash incentives, and, and uh, the governor of South Carolina just dumped $200 million alone on Volvo. Yeah, well, again, tax credits are not a good idea in my view. I've never been an advocate of that because I, I don't think that's a good transparent use of taxpayer dollars. Um, I think we do need some dollars to be strategic. But the most important thing is, is creating this climate. Again, the environment for success. And again, it shouldn't be just the companies going for incentives. Every time you give someone an incentive, it's at someone else's expense. So you do need to be very thoughtful about that. And the goal here is, how do you have a competitive tax rate, a competitive regulatory environment, all these fundamentals that we have done very well in Michigan, and that's why I, one of the reasons I'm really hammering this talent question, the skilled trade issue. We can win a huge percentage of these opportunities for continuing growth in state and companies coming from out of state by having the most talented people with the right skill sets. That is more important than many of these other tools you hear about other places doing, and they haven't figured that out yet. I'm convinced it's absolutely true. A funny story, I was in China a couple years ago. I had this guy, the CEO of a company walk in, and the first words out of his mouth is, tell me about your t tax credits so we can decide if we're gonna come or not. And I looked at him, I said, well, this is gonna be a really short conversation because I wiped him out and I'm not gonna bring him back. <laughs> and I said, but if you wanna talk, I know your business, and I believe the most important things to your business are having the most talented people with the right skill sets, and I believe it's being near your supply chain. And he goes, well, you're right. I said, you want to sit down, and I'll tell you why we're the best place in the country to set up. He sat down. It worked. <laughs> Doug Rothwell of the Business Leaders from Michigan uh, wrote an op-edit piece for the Free Press last Sunday that, that folks may have seen, uh, again, expressing concern over some of what was going on in, 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 uh, in the bills in the legislature where he, he, he sort of, I think you used the word disarming. We can't disarm. Other states are getting more aggressive, not less. And if we want, if we want to be the place where people locate you know, and make big bets, um, we can't disarm. So how do we arm ourselves going forward? Yeah, well, I've talked about the talent. One of the areas that we are adding significant budget resources to is additional training dollars for career tech education, for fields like that. So if an organization's coming in that says they have a need, wouldn't it be a good idea that we actually invested in our own people to help them offset the cost of training, to have them be successful? Isn't that a smart investment? Again, we want to help people be successful in helping them do that. We've got the resources, we've got the tools, and it's a win for all. Again, we should be looking at how we can actually bring up income levels in our state. That's a benefit. So this is that whole question of looking about how do we add to our population? How do we add the number of jobs, the quality of jobs, and the income levels? And figuring out what are the environmental conditions that we need to do that. And the exciting part I can tell you folks is I, I always describe it as looking at that board if you're running a race to say how many green lights and red lights you got on the board. When I became governor, that board was pretty much all red. It was ugly. And I can tell you, when I get, do my visual of that board, almost all the lights are green. 
We got a couple that are red to yellow that we need to work on. Energy policy, I would put on that list. Um, transportation on that list. But that board is almost all green. And shouldn't we just keep a metaphor like that going to say, how do we turn that board green and keep it green and just move forward? And I think we're well on the cusp of doing that. And the one thing I would ask of everyone here is not to come out of here and go wonder who introduced that bill and say, well, what's wrong with them? That, again, that's not the way to solve this problem. It's to respect the fact that they have a difference of opinion. It's more a case of how do we all get on the same page to say, here are the eight, 10, 12 different areas that we want to be really competitive on. We don't need to be the best in every one, but in combination, when you put them together, you're, you're awesome. And say, this is where we're targeting to go. And we've done an awesome job of getting probably 90% of the way already there today. Let's finish the job, and let's keep that board green. And just one more question on economic development, and just to refer to your energy policy analogy. On economic development policy, you, what would be the principles of, your, of yours, just like you said, reliability, affordability on energy? What are the key driving principles on economic yeah, development? Yeah, economic development start with talent. Always start with talent. Then you go tax, regulatory, consistency, certainty, legal system. Again, you walk through the basics like that. Incentives are near the bottom of the list. Again, financial climate, investment climate's important entrepreneurship climate. And we're doing very well on these. And that's why I look forward to having ongoing dialogue with the legislature, I hope, through the rest of this year and the future, and with all of you, to say, let's put out a, a piece that says, here's our, what our board looks like. Here's the colors it is. Here's what we got to do. And let's just get her done. And then let's go work on other problems. All right. <laughs> OK, I'll switch gears, get off this economic development thing for a minute. Um, but, no, but, I love economic development, but <laughs> but I um, but I had to I did hear you say make a reference to the fact that um, you weren't leaving the state of Michigan at all at, at the end of your term, and I just wanted to make sure that I understood you that that you will um, you will not run if nominated, not serve if elected. Is that to uh, or 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 appointed to a cabinet position? Um, I'm not running for president. I cleared that one up, so I'm happy to move forward and be, because again, I, I'm proud to be governor of Michigan. And one of the, the if you step and look at it, um, this is a job that's a huge honor. And I want to make sure it sticks. So that's why I felt it important to stay here. To be open, I am concerned about the future of our country. Um, we have a broken culture in our country for our political system. And I think this is one of the shining spots in our country to show how things can be done right. Um, you can't, we're a great country today. You cannot maintain being a great country if your leadership spends their time fighting and blaming one another. It doesn't work long term. <laughs> and just to finish that thought is, I don't think there are enough public servants, I encourage more to do it, to have the courage and conviction to refuse to fight and blame with people. I'm proud to say I haven't fought or blamed a single person since I've been governor of the state. I'm not going to do it when I'm governor of the state because you didn't hire me to waste time on negative actions. You hired me to make your life better and solve your problems. That's what we need through the public sector. And so if you find public officials, whether they be local, national, running for office, that attitude, I hope you get behind them. I'm term limited, so <laughs> I've already covered that base. <laughs> and, well, and you haven't used the, the old favorite whipping boy yet, the media. It's all the media's fault. No, it's not. Actually, I enjoy my relationship with the media. And uh, if you have anything you would like to add, Tom, I'd appreciate that because, <laughs> no, I. I think I've had a very good relationship with the media because I view us as partners. You have a different role than I have, but I view the media as one of the most critical outlets I have to use my soapbox. One of the great things of being governor is the ability to send a message out to people. Not about spending money, but talking to people. And to do that right, I need the media. And to give you a point of reference, you may not recognize this. And my staff tries to scare me once in a while. They, we actually have kept track since the time I've become governor. And in the first four years of being in office, I had done over 2,000 media interviews. 2,000. 
So if you think you talk to the press. <laughs> so, but it's a, a symbiotic relationship that I view it as it's very important dialogue and that's why hopefully I've always showed relentless positive action and respect and civility to members of the press. Well, I, and I would be happy to accept your challenge to, to speak up, but it keeps telling me, please wrap up on the sign. <laughs> so with that, I think we better wrap it up. And thank you very much, Governor. Thank you.